This is uh, the BE Collection. I'm here today, 6-2-2021. I'm Diane Barrett. I'm here with Sherry Jones. Sherry is a lawyer, attorney, Homeland Security, Immigration Department. She is now retired. So thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Perfect. So I'm just going to start with some questions that are really simple just so I get to know you a little bit more. And uh, we'll go from there. Okay, great. Where were you um, born? I was born in West Virginia. Uh -huh. My parents had um, been born and grew up in West Virginia and got married. And we were four. I have an older brother that was six. And they decided to move us to South Carolina because my mother had been there. My mother and father had been there several times uh, to the beach, Myrtle Beach, on vacation and loved it. And they wanted to get out of the coal mine. So uh, my dad told my mother, if you'll get me a job, we'll move. And she wrote letters to the electric company and to the telephone company. And he got a job with the telephone company, which he remained there for 36 years. So uh, what did he do there? He was a repairman installer at first, and then he was uh, did telecommunications with all the computer stuff in his final years. Would you say your mother was a dominant role model for you? Oh, she was. She <laughs> she she, uh, she worked also all through our life. She was a bookkeeper, and her last job was for twenty one years with a metal um, and welding company. Mm -hmm. She was the only female employee there for 20 years. So, ah, What did she do there? Did she work with her hands? She was the bookkeeper. The bookkeeper for And her. so she, she called it looking after her boys, mm -hmm. she, getting them paid, getting the bills paid, all of that stuff. But she, she mother hand them as well as us. So, And then how did you migrate yourself? Um, I... It's long. That's a long story. So we'll give it, give you all of it. I went to law school in at Mercer University in Macon, Georgia, mm -hmm. and from there, I got a job immigrate with the immigration judges out in Phoenix, Arizona, for a year. Then I was the chief judge's um, clerk for a year in D.C. So after that, I decided I would come home and be a private attorney at my, in my hometown. And I did that for about five years. And after that, I said, you know, it'd be better to get a government job. And I had a friend that was in Harlington, Texas, working, and she said they needed somebody. Uh, and so I interviewed for that job and got that job and moved to Texas. What made you decide to become an attorney? Um. I've always wanted to be an attorney. I guess too many Perry Mason shows <laughs> when I was growing up, but I always wanted to, I knew I couldn't do anything with my hands. I'm just not capable of, as y'all have seen, getting this set up, <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> um, I'm, I'm more brainstorming, reading, you know, read a lot as a child and just, um, just seemed like from about nine or 10, I always wanted to go to law school. That's what I would tell everybody. So did you identify with an attorney other than Perry Mason? Um, just all those shows, you know, um, but I didn't know any female attorneys per se uh -huh. to, to role model after. So I guess I was just cutting, cutting the edge there in my hometown Mm -hmm. um, I'm good friends with some some people that are still living there. And one of the guys said, you always said you wanted to be a lawyer. So I guess they remember it, too. You had a direction. Yeah. Very early on. That's great. So when your law school class, were, how, what was the percentage of women to men? Um, probably about 50-50 by then, uh. which was good. I mean, it had not been, excuse me. Had not been so, but it um, it was by then. I watched Perry Mason with my father, who's an attorney. <laughs> <laughs> he always won. Yeah, he always had that last minute uh, 
clincher that would get him out of trouble, wouldn't he? <laughs> right. he was a good strategist. Yeah, yeah. If that only happened in real life. <laughs> and that quickly. In that quickly, in an hour, yes. <laughs> so when were you aware of your sexuality? Um, therein, again, I would say I always knew I was different. Um, <laughs> you know, I was very much a tomboy, played with my brother. Um, and his friends and just didn't understand why in the summertime he could go without a shirt and I couldn't, um, this sort of thing, you know, when I was real small. And then as, as I grew up, I played sports, uh, enjoyed the camaraderie of that. And then when I went to college, I would say I really, you know, I had a girlfriend by the time I was 19. Uh-huh. And uh, she wasn't real sure, but I was very sure. Uh-huh. And we were on together and off together for about 10 years. I don't wow. do anything, you know, in, in and out. I usually hang in there. Um, Sherry and I have been together now 25 years. So it's- Congratulations. You That's know, right. yeah, I, I stay with somebody. <laughs> you work it out. I try to, yes. Mm -hmm. And she's been a, a, the love of my life is what I found finally. Takes a while, doesn't it? It does. Mm -hmm. Very good. So was this other woman in, in law school too, or is she just sort of? No, in fact, she went to undergrad with me uh -huh. and then she became a nurse and she lived in Atlanta and she would, we would see each other, you know, when we could. And she would come down when I was in law school, of course, and I would go up to see her in Atlanta. And um, she continues to work as a nurse with, uh, Probably the worst thing that about that whole uh, coupleship was after we broke up, she married her psychiatrist. And I just, I didn't think that <laughs> that was, was the way it should have been. <laughs> was her psychiatrist a woman? A male. A male. Uh -huh. Yes. So, um, you know, in fact, her mother said, he's an older gentleman, and her mother told her, said, well, I wish you had just stayed with Sherry versus RJ. So they were aware, even though they didn't talk about it a lot either. So. Uh, how about your own family? Were they aware of your... My own, my own family, they didn't, I really didn't just come out to them until I was about 30, I think. And I was living at home and working there and um, came in one weekend, just couldn't hold it in anymore. My dad said, oh, I thought you were going to tell us you were on drugs or you had some serious illness. I've always known that. Uh, well, my mom, they got on him and said, well, why haven't you told me? <laughs> but they, they accepted it very well. Um, my brother went through a divorce and that tried, his wife tried to make that an issue of why uh, we were allowed to see their <laughs> child. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, he, he, he said that wasn't going to be an issue, you know, that I would always see his child. Great. And he's the only grandchild and my only nephew. Uh, and so he, to this day, he, he adores us, you know. Uh, he would rather come to see the Texas connection as anybody <laughs> he calls us. So. Good. So then your family accepted you. That was great. Very much so, yes. Do you think that there's a, since we're, our goal here is to record the past and inspire the future. Sure. Um, was there any particular way of coming out to your family that you would recommend? Uh, I would say do it as early as you can, uh, you know, and just um, because they usually do have a sense that you're different. Mm -hmm. um, right. You know, I think, and um, I just think you holding it in is not a, is not doing anybody any good. And, and you have more time than to, to uh, everybody assimilate to what's going on, you know, and they adored Sherry. So I brought her in right away, you know. <laughs> um, it wasn't like we were going to wait around and introduce her when they came to Texas. I took her to South Carolina. Uh -huh. And um, they, they just immediately fell in love with her. And the only problem they had with her was, her name was Sherry too, so they have to call her <laughs> Smitty. So, so I'm Sherry, and she's Smitty and Andrews. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Good to know. 
the the but talking about coming out the one of the funniest things that has happened and I think would be inspiring to others is I I went through undergrad from 1981 to 1985 and you'd think well that was a pretty you know we were coming on out by then mm-hmm. and I it was a small liberal arts school in South Carolina and we have just recently talked with five of my friends that we remain real close with. We call, call it the firm. Uh, we get together <laughs> once, once a year. And none of them are lawyers, but they revolve around when I go to my bar convention. They uh-huh. come too. And we were sitting there talking and, uh, this past year uh, before the COVID got, stopped us from going. And they said they knew that I had a special relationship with Kim, but they didn't know what to call it. Mm -hmm. And that, that just struck me. I was like, well, it wasn't like there was no one gay around at that time. And they were just that hesitant to put a label on it because they, they didn't want me to feel different as well. I think it's still difficult. It's still difficult. Right. I thought that was unusual that they just said we didn't know what to call it, (laughs) you know. So, so, but they accept me, and again, they accept Sherry. You would thought she went to school when we did, you know. She's a she's a good bit older than us, but no, they she knows all the all the Presbyterian College stories and (laughs) all all the fun things we did. So she's one of us. She's very sharp. Yes, she is. How about in your occupation? Did you uh, experience any uh, bias or? The judges always referred to you when I first started practicing law as little lady or, Uh, you know, uh, that sort of thing. You you were still wearing skirts and dresses and pantsuits weren't allowed till till, uh, probably I was in practice for myself. And then that was becoming more accepted. But uh, you had to get used to the little ladies and the, ma'am, how are you today? Or, you know, and you would say you were fine. And I've had comments like you sure are from the male judges and, and things like that. Like, <laughs> so, you know, well, yeah, I, there, I know. there were times. <laughs> so, but in terms of your sexuality as being a lesbian, that part of it. Um, I, I never, um, when I went to the, to work with the government and became involved with Sherry, I just never made that an issue. She mm-hmm. was part of my family. And so if they were going to make an issue of it, I put it out there, you know, and I, she was, she was with me, you know, mm-hmm. and I, I never had a boss, uh, have a problem with it. They let me off when she was sick. They would let me off. Her mother passed away, you know. Um, they let me off for that. They're, I mean, they treated us like family because I treated her like family. Right. And that's I, a, think, I think that's a key phrase. because I think that's very important, I, yes. They're going to a lot of times make a big deal out of it if you make a big deal out of it. So. Uh, I know that. Uh, what to call it, this, now that we're married, um, People say my wife, and I always say, wow, wife. Yeah. (laughs) Sherry and I haven't actually been married. So uh, Uh that's, you know, and that's a lot of uh, something that a lot of people say, well, why haven't you? And we just, for a long time, she had monetary issues that required her. It was going to be a big deal that financially if we did. Uh And so even after that, though, we thought, it's just hasn't been a big deal to us, but mm-hmm. I guess to other people it would be. Well, uh, but we've it's never a legal been consideration. It's yeah, a, it's never been out of consideration, but it never right. been a big deal either. So we just, I guess we're lazy. <laughs> well, you're an attorney. <laughs> yeah, you're Every, a we can do it anytime. So that's 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 the relief. I think we're all living in today is that you have that choice. But that um, for me, the wife, I never wanted to be anybody's wife. And uh, Mark <laughs> definitely did not want to be a wife. 
Yes. So we say spouse, partner. We say partner. Heart. It sounds like you're in bed all the time having sex. Yeah, we say partner. And uh -huh. uh, Sherry had a pacemaker put in, and I was there from the Thursday that she went in to the Saturday. They let her loose after she had her pacemaker, and her little male nurse came in, and he said, you can't still be here. <laughs> and I, and you, I, no one stays that long. Say, so trust I me, said, I'm not leaving. <laughs> I said, well, when you love someone, you don't leave them. Mm -hmm. And he said, ma'am, I'm looking for a husband or wife like you. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that, that just kind of summarizes our relationship. She's yes. there for me and I'm there for her. So what a gift. Yeah, mm -hmm. it has been. Mm -hmm. So if you were to look back and um, think of a person or a situation that really made your direction clear to you, uh, does anyone or any situation come to mind? Um, probably uh, later in life, I went to basketball camps and, uh -huh. and that sort of thing. And you definitely knew some of the instructors who were basketball players for colleges and what have you were gay. You just knew that. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I thought, wow, you know, just to be that out, you know, available to people and, and around younger people, because, you know, you always thought, well, they wouldn't let them around us young people because some people think, you know, we're some kind of pervert or what mm -hmm. have you, but that, really inspired me Did it? That, that you know that just live your life out loud if you will you're really a good role model for that <laughs> well i i've tried because i i just hate to think people sitting around swallowing all of that pain and agony if they if they're not living a true life i i appreciate that I, I appreciate you for yeah. being such a great, steady With, role model. Thank you. So, do you have questions you'd like to ask me? Um, I can't think of any right off. Mm -hmm. I will tell you that the reason I retired is I'm bipolar, and that's something, too, that comes up. Mm -hmm. um, not necessarily with my sexuality, but uh, I've run into a good number of, of um, people both heterosexual and homosexual mm -hmm. that suffer from that. And uh, that was something that was really hard for me to deal with when I retired. Um, it felt like I was giving up. Uh -huh. And um, since then, I've, I've really had to deal with about uh, what, 13 years of, of getting to be something other than just being a lawyer, you know. Mm -hmm. Because once you, and you know this from your background, I think once you get into a career field, you feel like I am a lawyer. That's what I am. That's what I identify with. Right. And then after, after I retired, it's like, well, what am I? You know, <clears throat> I, I'm so many other things. And I think that's helped. And I know I've helped some people that I've run into uh, that suffer the different mental illnesses, you know, and, and just feel like they're nothing, you know. Uh, that's a good point. So how have you handled that for yourself? Well, I've, I've had to find other things to do. I'm trying to write a book right now. And so uh, that that's kept me busy. And friendships, we've got close friendships uh -huh. with other people. Uh, you know, Karen and Lolly and right. just adore them and uh, some other lesbian friends we we go and see and do with them and so travel a good bit back and forth to South Carolina now because my mom suffers dementia huh. and my dad is 80 going to be 88 years old and he's trying to take care of him and her and mm -hmm. she's she's 83 so um, I'm back and forth between there and so I know um, there was a reason for me to retire. Right. It's hard to do. Mental illness, but I, there would be no way I could help him take care of her if I was still trying to work, too. Mm -hmm. so. I know when we first started this, you were visiting your parents. Yes. Right? Yes. So. 
I usually go for five or six weeks and then I'll come home for a couple of months and then go again. Uh, it's been hard on Sherry and I to be apart, but she has been the most supportive um, partner anybody could have about that. She said, you know where you need to be. So. Mm-hmm. so you have a lot of maturity in your relationship. You yes, we do. We, we do. Right. That's important. So now you're retired. You're going to write a book about. It's just a, it's a fictional. It's fictional, uh-huh. but it's about a lawyer. Uh-huh. Good. That, that went through some mental illness uh, and okay. come out on the other side. And uh, When did you get that diagnosis? Um, 1994. Huh. Okay. So I've, I've been dealing with it a long, long time. Did it help to know to have a label? Yeah, it did. And it helped to get the right medication. Mm -hmm. That was very hard, as as my doctor says, to get the right cocktail. Uh uh, Because you had to get this one. And half the time, the side effects of that one would be worse than what you needed for this one. So um, probably the last five years have been really good as far as no ups and downs, you know, the medication's been exactly right. And right. and you just keep on keeping on. But yeah. Did it affect your work, your focus? It, it did. Um, I, I'm off, I often say that I couldn't have gone through law school had I not been a manic depressive person. <laughs> you, know, you stay on a mania as long as you can. And then during the summer, you just rest, you know, so you could go into a low, but, um, it did. At the end there, I, I had a hard time sleeping. And without sleep, you can't get up and go and do what you need to do. So what was going um, on that made you seek help in the first place for it? Um, I, I had just gotten to the point where I would be in spells where I could not rest. Um, and I would take this was while I was still practicing in my hometown. And I would take in like hundreds of cases you know Uh, and then in six months I'd be to a point where I didn't even want to get out of the bed and go to the office so I knew something was wrong uh and uh, I sought out help and then they were helping me on the depressed side because that's when they would see me when I was in a mania I didn't need help Mm -hmm. Um, so finally I read the uh, book a Brilliant Madness by Patty Duke Austin and diagnosed myself. Uh-huh. <laughs> and, and I went into the to the professionals I was seeing at the time and I threw the book down and I said, this is what I've got. This is me. And then they <laughs> said, well, how do you know? And I said, I read it in a weekend. Everything she says, I can say me too. And so if you need to do any more testing, do it. But let's let's get me on some medication. So how old were you then? Um, right around the 30 year old. Uh-huh. So I had suffered some a good bit during my 20s, but nothing severe, you mm-hmm. know, till about then. And I think just all the work that I was doing in my hometown, because it was, you know, being a solo practitioner is hard. Right. Um, and so I was doing that as well as uh, part time work for the Department of Social Security. Uh, social services um, with the uh, abused and neglected children, which are very hard cases as well. So it was a lot of work, and finally, I think it just came to a head. It's probably good that you. Oh yes, yes. Diagnosis, and then moved into sort of civil service. Service, and, right. and I, of course, you had to tell them back then of all the. Uh, mental illnesses and any kind of illnesses you had and get a letter from your psychiatrist that you wouldn't push the red button if you got left in charge. (laughs) So uh, what's the red button? That's I I laugh about that with the president. Supposedly there's a red button that will, um, you know, whoever our enemies are. Uh And so they just have to make sure that you're competent enough that if you're left in charge now, like you'd ever be a lawyer down in lower Texas being left in charge of the whole world, you wouldn't press that button. Did that button actually exist? 
Uh, I think it does, but, <laughs> but I think a lot of people have uh, the combination. Mm -hmm. So you have really approached a lot of challenges very well. Uh, I've tried. <laughs> yeah. So your book. No, I want a signed copy. Okay, you've got uh, it. What's you've the name? It. Does it have a title yet? Um, it's not really. Okay. I'm working on that too. <laughs> All righty. If I think of any good titles, I'll send them your way. Well, right now the working <laughs> title is Old Flames. Old it, Flames. And it's it's a based around a fire, but also other things as well. So that'll draw a lot of people in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> good title. So if you knew that you were going to uh, you had a fatal illness, you were not have long to live, what would you like people to know about you? Well, I would hope that they think that I tried to do well in everything that I did. You know, that I tried to help those that needed the help and uh, that, that I just tried to do my best. I think you've proved that. Well, well that's nice of you to say anyway. <laughs> No, it's been my pleasure to meet you. You too. You come to Los Angeles, we'd like to see the Sherry's. Okay, yeah, that's a that's a given. And if you come this way, please feel like you can stay with us. Were you? In, oh, this is Marge throwing in a question. She wanted to know if you were an assistant in the Supreme Court. No, I was in the immigration courts. Right. Both times. So yeah, no, I didn't get that high. I, I did go to see a case be tried once in the Supreme uh, Court. Uh, that was a thrill. <laughs> I bet, huh? It was a real thrill. Yeah. You, Ruth? Yes. You did, huh? Okay. Yeah. Do so, you have any questions or anything you want to add? I don't think so. This has been great. So thank you. And thank you. Have a good evening. You too. Okay. Bye. Bye.